Okay, so, uh, and I've got data to back this up from British wind farms in windy locations. They vary, and the mean is roughly two and a half watts per square meter, uh, including onshore and offshore wind farms in the British Isles. Um, some people think I'm being anti-wind by saying this. I, I'm not anti-wind. I, I, I am actually pro-wind, and I'm especially pro-arithmetic, and I just want us to have <laughs> honest numbers where we really visualize what needs to be done. But perhaps talking about half of a country being occupied by wind farms is a negative uh, way to put things. Let's put it another way. Let's uh, personalize what we're talking about and imagine a community of people making a decision. Let's imagine not trying to get a full 125 light bulbs per person from wind, but just getting, say, 17 kilowatt hours per day per person, which is the UK's average electricity consumption. Note, energy comes not just in electricity, but in other forms for transport and heating and so forth. Let's aim for 17 light bulbs per person. What community decision do you need to make? Well, 700 people could make the decision to own one of these enormous cathedrals of architecture, one two megawatt turbine. And if the 700 people join hands around that turbine, that's an accurate visualization of the potential of wind. Wind farms do work, if they're located in uh, windy locations at least. And the output of that turbine, on average, would be the entire electricity consumption of those people. So I think there are positive ways to, to visualize wind turbines, and perhaps the public attitude to wind farms can be transformed. Next, let's talk about energy crops. Uh, energy crops in northern climates deliver something like half a watt per square meter. Here's miscanthus, which is a famous new energy crop people talk about. And here's some data on real productivities of various energy crops. These ones are in northern climates. In tropical climates, you can get more from the C4 crops as long as you apply fertilizer and irrigation. But a ballpark figure of half a watt per square meter implies that even if you cover the whole of the UK or the whole of Massachusetts with the, uh, the best energy crops, you still can't match the power consumption of that region. That message doesn't apply to Brazil. Brazil can cover a fraction of itself with energy crops and power itself if it wants to. So the answers are different for different countries. Here's some more renewables. And the message for all of them is, much as I love them, they are all diffuse. They all have a small power per unit area, similar to that of the wind farms with which we started. Solar panels on roofs, for example, deliver something like 20 watts per square meter in Britain. Britain's not the sunniest place. So uh, you could get more if you put them in a sensible place, such as India or China, um, or, uh, or uh, Africa indeed. And Arizona is also obviously a, a good candidate. Uh, but 20 watts per square meter is, is the actual output of these solar panels in Britain, which means if you cover all south-facing roofs in Britain with solar panels, what you would deliver is about five light bulbs per person of power which is quite a substantial amount. It shows up on the scale that goes up to 125 light bulbs per person, but it's only, only that much. And so if you're really wanting solar to make a huge contribution comparable to our total consumption, we need to go a little bit crazy, leap off the roof, and do what the Germans do. Here's the traditional Bavarian farming method where you coat the countryside with solar panels also. Spacing them apart with gaps in between and avoiding shadows means that the power per unit land area is reduced to five watts per square meter. That's just twice as good as wind farms in terms of power per unit area. In terms of cost, this is a lot more expensive than, than wind farms. So the message is still a roughly country-sized area would have to be occupied if you want to match today's consumption. Next, tide pools are a possible technology with places with big tides. Uh, there's a tide pool on the east coast of England here that's been there for 800 years. You let water in, you let it out uh, at low tide and uh, get something to go around. And the power per unit area of tide pools, here's an example in France, a rather larger modern uh, tide pool. The power per unit area is about 2.7 watts per square meter, much the same as wind farms. So straight away, we know the message. The message is, if you want tide pools to really make a big contribution, you need a tide pool not the size of a small estuary, but you need a tide pool roughly the size of a country. And God, in his wisdom, when he created the British Isles, provided us with exactly such a facility. It's called the North Sea. <laughs> the North Sea is an enormous natural tide pool, in and out of which and round which great sloshes of energy pour every 12 hours. And here on the map in yellow are shown the places where the natural currents are already very big. And we could exploit those natural flows by putting something that goes round 
into those yellow spots. Indeed, lots of underwater windmills, such as this one which has recently been launched in Northern Ireland, uh, many of those, thousands of them, tens of thousands, could be deployed in these yellow spots. What's the power per unit area? Well, something like 8 watts per square meter is my estimate of what these underwater wind farms could deliver. So perhaps three times as good as an above ground uh, wind farm. So we're still in the same ballpark. Perhaps uh, a one-sixth of a country-sized tide farm would uh, match today's power consumption. Next, let's talk about hydroelectricity. The power per unit area of rainfall arriving at ground level in British highland areas is about a quarter of a watt per square meter. So you need a very large catchment area uh, to get anywhere near today's power consumption. In Britain, the hydroelectricity was originally developed there, but now it delivers about 0.2% of our total energy consumption. Concentrating solar power in deserts uh, delivers about uh, 15 or 20 watts per square meter. Here's a photograph of some beautiful concentrators uh, being developed, I believe, in America. Um, of course, Britain and Massachusetts don't have any deserts uh, yet. <laughs> but let's look at them anyway. Uh, here's a prototype in Spain which will use molten salt which can be stored at night so as to generate solar power at night as well as during the day. This facility is predicted to have a power output of 10 watts per square meter when it's finished. This one delivers 5 watts per square meter. And here's another device using concentrating solar power onto photovoltaics delivering this single device delivers 140 kilowatt hours per day. The Americans' total energy consumption is 250 kilowatt hours per day per person, so you need slightly more than one of these objects per person if you want to match today's power consumption. Uh, that's power in all forms, electricity, transport, heating, the lot. And here's a person for scale. Here on the next picture is an, a former American president for scale alongside one of these Stirling engine uh, devices, uh, which are equally large and have a very similar output. Again, 160 light bulbs is the average output of one of these things. So let's keep on all the options on the table until we've got ourselves a plan that adds up. Uh, the message about the renewables is... To make a difference, renewable facilities do have to be countrysized. And you could say, oh, I'm going to have a diversity. I'm not going to focus just on solar. I'll have a mix. Well, no problem. They all have roughly the same power per unit area. So this, the total area occupied still has to be the same as what we were just talking about. We we're talking about roughly half of Massachusetts, roughly half of the UK is the ballpark area that we need to uh, imagine if renewables are going to add up. And there's some people in denial over this saying uh, that this would, uh, they don't like intrusive um, renewable facilities like the Seven Barrage proposed for the estuary in, in Britain. Um, and I don't understand what the less striking measures are that they have in, in mind. Well, maybe they're right. It, they say less striking measures would cost less and could do more to cut carbon emissions. Well, if all they want is a 1% cut in carbon emissions, then they're absolutely right. You get everyone to grasp the thermostat and rotate it to the left one degree in the winter so that we don't heat our buildings quite so much. That would give a 1% cut in carbon emissions too. But do we just want a 1% cut in carbon emissions? Uh, if we're serious about getting off fossil fuels, we presumably are interested in 90% cuts. That's what the climate scientists are asking us to achieve by 2050. So I'm sorry, we need to keep some of these intrusive options on the table until we've got the plan that adds up. It could be that the RSPB, uh, when they were saying they want less striking measures, it could be that what they had in mind was actually nuclear power. Nuclear power, in terms of its intrusiveness, in terms of the area required for a nuclear uh, source, is uh, much less intrusive. Um, here's a one kilometer square on a map, and it's got a size well B inside it. Size well B is a one gigawatt power station, and so we have a power per unit area of 1,000 watts per square meter, which is 400 times better than the wind farm. Uh, of course, this is not the only metric we should be using in comparing power sources. There are other considerations, there's cost and risks and, and so forth. But in terms of area occupied, uh, nuclear facilities do have a higher power density. Now, we live in democracies, and in democracies, at least in Britain, we have to have consultation exercises when we imagine building new energy infrastructure. And here's a photograph of a consultation exercise in full swing in the little town of Pennycook, just south of Edinburgh. And you can see the children of Pennycook celebrating the burning of the effigy of the wind farm 
Because if there's one thing the British people are good at, it's saying no. And here's just a few more organizations <laughs> expressing their opinions. So there is a, a public difficulty, not only with nuclear, but also with wind. And that's summarized on this map, which shows in white the places that are too near to human habitations, um, therefore ruled out because of disturbing humans. And in black, the regions which are more than two kilometers from a human habitation. And therefore, these locations are tranquil. And we can't go spoiling tranquil locations with <laughs> wind farms, can we? So anywhere that's not black or white on the map is fine. <laughs> now, you might say, oh, yes, of course, we'll put them offshore, because no one objects to offshore wind farms, do they? But uh, here's Save Our Scenery, and here's people worrying about threats to airports, uh, threats to surfers, fishermen, and the military who can't defend us uh, because the radar won't work anymore um, when we have wind farms in the sea. Um, so all of those constraints uh, cause great difficulties and perhaps rule out most of the areas where you would like to have wind farms. You wouldn't have any such problems over here, would you, in a <laughs> rational country when you discuss your wind options? Oh, well, a couple of years ago, there were a few people uh, having lively conversations about uh, Cape Wind. So what's the, the big picture? The big picture is Countries in the top right-hand side of this diagram will truly struggle to power themselves solely on renewables, especially if we can't transform the public attitude to renewables. What should we do about that? Well, there's various approaches. One is to politely ask countries at the top left of this diagram, like Australia, Canada, and Libya, uh, you have plentiful renewables um, per, uh, per person, so please could you export to us some of your renewables that we don't want to build in our backyard? Another approach would be to look for other ways of moving this dot, perhaps um, down and to the left um, again, um, or to look at other sources of supply in addition to renewables. So here's what I'm imagining you might be able to get. Uh, this is a comparison of our 125 light bulb habit, habit today with what we might be able to get from renewables without huge public objections. How can we make a plan that adds up? Well, we can do something to the demand, and we could do something else to the supply. So on the demand side, we could reduce population to bring ourselves back down. I don't know how to do that in a friendly way. <laughs> you could ask people to change their lifestyle so that they don't use so much energy. You know, use less transport, less heating, buy less stuff, throw less things away, uh, become vegetarian, and so forth. But I become a bit terrified of suggesting lifestyle when I encounter people whose off-road driving consists of parking on the grass on the verge of the road uh, in a car that has teeth. Um, <laughs> So my strategy when I present the numbers is to say, well, let's leave lifestyle change on the table just off to one side, and let's discuss everything else we can do and see if we can make a plan that adds up that is our, to our liking. And then we can always bring the lifestyle change back in at the end of the conversation if we feel like it. So I'm not forcing um, any recommendation on anyone. Let's just see if we can make a plan that adds up. What are the other ways of reducing demand? Well, technology. Uh, Boston's a famous home of um, technology innovation. And isn't it possible to just solve everything with, with wonderful technology uh, that's more efficient and allows us to have the same lifestyle uh, but use far less energy? Let's think about that. Then on the supply side, our supply side options could include clean coal, which means let's carry on using fossil fuels after all, but do something better with the carbon dioxide. Nuclear power, which is another fossil fuel with various popularity problems. And finally, the option I mentioned earlier of politely asking another country or another state, such as Arizona, uh, please, can we have your renewables because we don't want ours? So let's talk through the efficiency and technology options very quickly using a cartoon of consumption that says it's going into transport, heating, and electricity. How do we, how do we make transport more efficient? Well, here's the five physics principles we need to apply. Transport uses energy for various reasons. If you make your vehicles have small frontal area per person, that reduces the air resistance. If you have a vehicle with small weight per person, that reduces, reduces rolling resistance and braking losses. If you can get your vehicle to convert energy efficiently from one form to another, incidentally, petrol and diesel engines are only 25% efficient at turning chemical energy into oomph. If we can convert energy more efficiently, then we're going to be more efficient, obviously. Fourth, go slowly uh, to reduce air resistance and braking losses. And fifth, go steadily to reduce the braking losses. So we take all these five phys physics principles. We start from an average European car using 80 kilowatt hours for every 100 person kilometers it generates. That's if it's singly occupied in the traditional way. A 
apply all five principles, and we end up with a new piece of technology called the bicycle. This is